Now let's take a look at appeasement which is mainly associated with Neville Chamberlain. And this was brought up by one of my Obersts from Patreon. He asked a question about, is it true that Chamberlain made the most errors there or is there some more nuance to it? And this mainly focuses on the appeasement which saw probably the height or the most infamous part was around the Sudeten crisis in 1938 about Czechoslovakia. So after the Anschluss of Austria in March, Hitler basically looked at the Sudeten Deutsche, the Germans in the Sudetenland around the outer regions of, of the Czechoslovakia and this led to the Munich Agreement which basically meant that the outer parts of Czechoslovakia were stripped away to avoid war to lead to peace for our time, as Neville Chamberlain claimed it. Now, the appeasement policy for us in hindsight makes very little sense, but we need to take a look at the context. Now, for this, we need to take a look at the bigger picture. So what is very important here is we need to look at the British Empire. And this was a global seafaring empire and it had global security requirements. And additionally, the British very rarely relied on land power. Their focus was always usually on sea power and nowadays, or back then, not nowadays, back then also a lot on air power. So this needs to be, be taken into consideration. So they look not only at Europe, but on the whole issue, on India, on the Pacific area, everywhere. Because they have possessions nearly all over the planet, the Royal Navy is a global force and everything. Now this leads to the second point. Basically, British foreign policy was guided by two principles up to the end of 1938. One, that Europe could be divided in East and West, and the East was not vital to British interests. And the second principle was that it was possible and desirable to reach an agreement with Germany. So to give them some possessions and give them some livery. And then the British don't have to care too much about Germany, don't need a land power and everything. So to a certain degree, they also assumed that a German domination of Eastern Europe was unavoidable. And again, that it was not vital to British interests. So they were mainly looking at on the whole, on the whole planet and saying, okay, Europe, okay, Germany, you, you have, can have something of the East and we give you something and then leave, leave us in peace. Now, a third point is they were quite reluctant to ally to anyone or to commit themselves. So they were quite reluctant to have an alliance with France and even way less with the Soviet Union. The foreign office was mainly anti-communist and some even saw Germany as a barrier against communism, against the barrier against the Soviet Union in the East. Now the fourth point is that diplomacy after the First World War changed. So what was done before the First World was often seen as a diplomacy that led to the Great War and they wanted to avoid it. Additionally, the public, the general public wanted peace. So there was a strong focus here to keep the peace and to hope it will work out. Now, one major issue here is there was no response for a pessimistic view on German politics, on German foreign politics. So they assumed to a certain degree a best case scenario. There were already several ones that warned quite intensively that this diplomacy, which was done after the First World War, can't continue in this way. And there are other important aspects we need to consider as well. Appeasement was always in strong coordination with deterrence. So to build up a strong force so that dictators or other, other powers can be to a certain degree also deterred to go to war. And Chamberlain was very focused on the Royal Air Force, so on air power. And also additionally, the other focus is to avoid land forces. Chamberlain was quite negative about land forces. And to achieve to a certain degree this, this durable agreement with Germany, which they assumed they could achieve, it was ideally would be multilateral with several nations an agreement, but they were also going to do it bilaterally. Best example is in 1935, the naval agreement 
between Germany and the United Kingdom or the British Empire. So that the Germans could build up to 35% of the British tonnage and around 45% for the U-boats. Of course, as we know now, the appeasement strategy didn't work out. That's very important here. Chamberlain was basically the scapegoat for appeasement and everything. But as you can see, there was a bigger context. Still, even historians nowadays are not very kind about him because he made some clear errors. For instance, there were several in the foreign office that made clear warnings and assessment that to deal with Germany under the Nazis is something different because they have different views. And he, to a certain degree, quite often circumvented the foreign office. For instance, he often sent personal emissaries to Germany to negotiate behind the official channels, you could say. And he also marginalized classic diplomacy. For instance, when he flew alone, basically, to Germany and to negotiate with Hitler. So this was very, very out of touch, you could say. And he has a myopic focus on agreement with Germany. So he wanted to get an agreement with Germany. And again, he never seems to have questions. Okay, maybe they want something different. Maybe that's not enough. So my conclusion is basically you need to take into context the whole British view on global security requirements and that they saw basically Eastern Europe as a, to a certain degree to a sideshow and not as vital. Additionally, Chamberlain was scapegoated a lot, but he also made clear errors in judgment and his actions. So I guess he's not the sole scapegoat as rarely is the case. But to a certain degree also we need to take into the context of the time and the, the British whole view on global strategy. So he wasn't completely out of touch with, with the whole strategy and with the whole view, but more on how he implemented it and how it didn't basically change his course. I mean, after Munich, he basically changed his course, but then it was already way too late. So basically the piece for our time must be also seen in the context of their time. Because they were, they, the British and the French, were basically focused on preventing another world war. Now the question of course remains, if harsher policies and less appeasement would have prevented a war in the first place, and I highly doubt it. The war would have taken another course and probably started earlier or in a different way. But at this point, I think around 1933 onwards, the war was likely unavoidable. Of course, in the very beginning, after the Nazis took power, they clearly looked and tried to, to keep it low with the rearmament, something I discussed in another video. And it might have turned out quite differently, but it's hard to tell. From what I know and read, Hitler was very much focused on starting a war. So thank you for watching. Big thank you to my Patreons and especially Andrew for asking this question. And also a big thank you to Justin for helping me out with some intelligence questions. Thank you very much and see you next time.